Lord John Schaefer was a man you would think you could trust. He was, after all, a sheriff's deputy. But after a botched encounter with two unsuspecting girls, Gerard is forced to turn in his badge. And what his fellow officers thought was merely bad judgment turned into a nightmare of dead bodies, mementos, and written stories of lust and murder. This is Gerard John Schaefer, the serial killer cop. Hey y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. Everybody. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. And for our friends way down there in Panama. Panama. Buenos, buenos, buenos. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, wherever you're listening, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. You can like it, rate it, review it. That yep. helps other people to find us. And if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button below. Please do. You can find us on Instagram at Hitch to Homicide or on X at H2H underscore podcast. And if you want true crime with us every day of the week, please join our closed Facebook group, The In-Laws and Outlaws. Go to Facebook, type in H2H In-Laws and Outlaws, answer a few questions, and you're in. So go join. I've had lots of people who try to find the website. It is hitched number two yes. homicide. Yes, two. Number two. That's correct. One, two, three, <laughs> two, one. It's a good crew of true crime loving folks. Yep. I also post lots of photos and other information in there, like the fact that I am battling as we start season five. I am battling allergies like nobody's business. So I apologize for my James Earl Jones voice. <laughs> it's very sexy. It's very sexy. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's so sexy when I sniff all the time. <laughs> and I'm blowing my nose constantly. Yeah. <laughs> so I apologize from the get-go. Yep. We're getting case suggestions and true crime listener stories, so keep them coming. We appreciate all of you, everybody who listens each week, everybody who takes a moment to drop us a note. We really, really do appreciate it. Yes, we do. And I apologize once again <laughs> for all of this. <laughs> it's not a, not, I had it last week. Yeah. And then I gave it to you. No, these are allergies. I'm not saying I'm sick. Yeah, okay. I'm not going there. Okay. It's allergies. All right, all right. I'm not getting sick. All right. <laughs> this case is incredibly interesting on lots of levels because where's the best place to hide? I don't know. In plain sight. Ah. And I was just having this conversation with someone the other day about how serial killers love to hide in plain sight. Yeah. Before we get started, let me thank some sources. Criminalminds.fandom.com, Wikipedia, Murderpedia, the South Florida Sun Sentinel, KIRO Channel 7, the Palm Beach Post, the Tampa Tribune, and Sky Vision's Cops That Kill. All right. Well, you ready? I am. Let's do it. Gerard John Schaefer, or GJ... Not going to call him that. I'm just going to call him Gerard. <laughs> G.J. It okay. makes him sound like he's too cold. Yeah. He's born in Wisconsin on March 25th, 1946 to parents Gerard and Doris Schaefer. Okay. He's a big brother. He's got two younger sisters. And he thinks his father favors his sisters over him. Hmm. Now, he's born in Wisconsin, but they moved to Atlanta where he went to Marist Academy, which is a private Catholic school. As an adult, he described to a psychiatrist that he was, quote, an illegitimate child, end quote, the product of a shotgun wedding. Okay. He would later describe his father as verbally abusive and an alcoholic and an adulterous husband who was always away on business trips. Mm -hmm. He liked to kill animals as a child. Yeah. And he also enjoyed cross-dressing. Really? Yeah. 
animal killing and cross-dressing. I'm going to say that. What could go wrong? Yeah, there's a recipe for disaster. As an adult, his psychiatrist also said that he had numerous sexual hang-ups. At 12 years old, he began experimenting with bondage and sadomasochism. At 12? At 12. Wow. Saying, quote, I'd tie myself up to a tree and get excited sexually and do something to hurt myself, end quote. Good grief. I didn't even have my first kiss until I was like 15 or 16. 15? Yeah. It was. Well, I had a kiss before 15. (laughs) Yeah. And I remember where it was. It was uh, in front of the bus stop out in front of the high school. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. Mine was on the front doorstep after a dance. Uh, and I believe I was 13. No. Uh, anyway, <laughs> but we digress. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting excited tying himself to a tree. Wow. And then he would hurt himself. Jeez. And around this same time, he would masturbate and fantasize about hurting people, hmm. especially women. Really? And this is when he really got into women's underwear. He admitted that he wore them sometimes and that he wanted to hurt himself, meaning like he liked wearing women's panties. And because of that, he was angry at himself and wanted to hurt himself for Hmm. it. Interesting. He would play these violent, self-loathing games where in his mind he always got killed. Hmm. Quote, I wanted to die. My father favored my sisters, so I wanted to be a girl. I wanted to die because I was such a disappointment to my family As a kid, I couldn't please my father, so in playing these games, I wanted to be killed, end quote. So I don't think you have to be Freud to figure this one out. (laughs) He's got a lot going on in that noggin of his. Yeah, and it's not all good. I also read that he liked to wear women's underwear to avoid the draft, which he did somehow because (laughs) this is the Vietnam era. Section 8. We always talk about Corporal Klinger. We talked about him like three or four times. Yeah. When he's 14, his family moves to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and he enrolls in St. Thomas Aquinas High School, another private Catholic school. As a teen, he's not only obsessed with women's panties, he's a voyeur. He's a, he likes to spy. He's a peeping Tom. It's like, in, it's like in Back to the Future. He's a peeping Tom. He's a peeping Tom. He's a peeping Tom. <laughs> He likes to watch the girl next door who apparently doesn't close her blinds properly. Lee is her name. That's called foreshadowing. Uh Uh-oh. Hang on. Okay. Ready, Scotty? Here we go. Yep. There you go. While he was in high school, he somehow managed to maintain a relationship with a girl named Cindy. Their three-year-long relationship was an odd one where he liked to make Cindy participate in bizarre sexual fantasies where he tore off her clothes and pretended to rape her. And once again, how old was he now? He's in high school. Good grief. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He also dated a girl named Sandra. Gerard is, he's a good-looking kid, blonde hair, blue eyes. He looks like the all-American boy. Okay. When he graduates in 1964, he enrolls at Florida Atlantic University. Okay. He said he visited a psychiatrist during this time in 1966 when he's 20. He's looking for relief from his sexual deviance and homicidal fantasies. Hmm. But he said that therapy didn't help him. And if you can believe what he's saying later in life, he heard voices telling him to kill. Wow. At the same time this is happening, get this, he's touring with the Up With People group. (laughs) Man. I remember seeing them perform when I was a kid. Up, Up With People? Yeah, they do all these feel-good songs about being a good person. Weren't they the same ones that did, uh, uh, we like to teach the world I have no idea. That's a Coca-Cola commercial. I know. I think they used Up With People to do that. Oh, did they? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he's doing this, it's 1966, and he's hearing voices telling him to kill people Mm. while he's jumping about and singing and frolicking and singing (laughs) up with people. I'd like to teach the world to kill. Yeah, you're going to get emails about that. (laughs) Address those to Rob. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Now, while at college, he meets and marries Martha Fogg in 1968. 
but two short years later, she divorces him, citing, quote, extreme cruelty, end quote. Hmm. He decides that maybe he should go into the priesthood. Can't think of a worse thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's wow. turned away by the St. John's Seminary. They told him, quote, you don't have enough faith, end quote. <laughs> and this made him so angry that he just up and quit Jesus altogether. He quit the Catholic Church, everything. He was done. You, I want to be a part of this. You don't want me. I'm out. I'm out of here. I'm tapping out. Yep. He decided he wanted to be a teacher. His goal was to, quote, instill American values, end quote, like honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Hmm. Okay. But two different times, he was dropped from student teaching programs. The first at Plantation High School for, quote, trying to impose his own moral and political values on his students, end quote. Mm. The second time, his supervisor, a man named Richard Goodhart, said, quote, I told him when he left that he better never let me hear of his trying to get a job <laughs> with any authority over other people or I'd do anything I could to prevent it, end quote. Wow. There's a ringing endorsement. You're a horrible person. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Goodhart. Yeah. You mean like becoming a police officer? Yeah. Wow. After the divorce... Gerard takes a few weeks off to get his head together. It's never going to happen. Yeah. His head's never going to be together. He goes to Europe and to North Africa that summer. Really? And when he comes back to Florida, he's got a new goal in life. He wants to be a police officer. Hi, I'm Douglas Fackler. I always wanted to be a cop. Mm. Now, let me stop right there because I just want to say... We support the men in blue. There are a lot of really great police officers out there. Absolutely. This guy's not one of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. He's just not one of them. Yeah, that's not going to work. He applied to lots of different police departments in the Florida area, including the Broward County Sheriff's Department, where he was rejected because he failed the psychological test. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, right. The Wilton Manors Police Department hired him, and he graduated as a patrolman at the end of 1971 when he is just 25 years old. Hmm. Wilton Manors is just north of Fort Lauderdale. Okay. So still on the edges of a big area. Sure. In March of 1972, Gerard earned a commendation for his help during a drug bust. Then on April 20th, just one month later, he was fired. Why? Fired. Why? Well, there are a couple different stories about this. Chief Bernard Scott said that Schaefer didn't have, quote, an ounce of common sense, end quote. <laughs> He's an idiot. But an ex-FBI agent, Robert Ressler, reported the Schaefer got in trouble for running female traffic violators through the police department's computer. Oops. He'd stop them, give them a ticket, look up their personal information, and then call them later and ask them out on a date. Oh, my gosh. Now, all my police officers out there who listen to this podcast, I want to know, <laughs> are you allowed <laughs> to ask somebody out that you've pulled over for some reason? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no as well, but we need confirmation on yeah, that. One. Yeah. Any of our police officer friends out there. Let us know. Yep. But for whatever reason, he's fired, he's unemployed, he needs a job. So at the end of June in 1972, he signs on to work with the Martin County Sheriff's Department in Stewart, Florida, which is about 80 miles north of Fort Lauderdale. Okay. So he's picking up and moving. Right. Martin County, Florida thinks he's one of their most promising recruits. <laughs> he's also considered a local boy who knows the area well. He knows the swamp lands well. He's well-liked. And all the other officers really like him. But here's the thing. They think I he's mean, great. He got fired because of indiscretion. Didn't they take that into consideration when they hired him? I don't know how it didn't follow him yeah. 80 miles north. Yeah. But apparently it didn't. I know there wasn't the internet then, but like you said, it's only 80 miles. Only 80 miles. Wow. A phone call. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. What do you think of Gerard Schaefer? It says here he worked for you. And they would be like, he's... He's shady boots. Yeah. <laughs> Don't hire him. Yeah, yeah. Now, less than a month after he takes this job, he screws up big time. 
On July 21st, 1972, Schaefer picks up two hitchhikers. Mm. And I know it's the 70s and people were big into hitchhiking back then. Yeah. It's always a bad idea. Well, wait a minute. Was he in his patrol car when he did this <laughs> or was he in the civilian? What? What's, what's the deal? Hang on. Uh, Hang on. I'm uh, going to tell you. Hanging. 17-year-old Pamela Wells and 18-year-old Nancy Trotter are picked up on the highway near the beach. He falsely tells them that hitchhiking is illegal in Martin County. <laughs> he does this because he's in his cruiser. Uh, so to answer your question, yeah. yeah. Wow. He drives them back to the house where they're staying for the night, telling them that he'll come get them the next day so they're safe. So he can drive them to the beach himself. Jeez. So this police officer picks him up. It's illegal, girls. Get in the back of the cruiser. Let me take you to where you're staying tonight. Yeah. yeah. You're going to the beach tomorrow. I will come get you myself. Keep you safe. And what do you think the girls said? Sure. That'd be great. Thank you, officer. Yeah. The next day, he shows up in plain clothes and not in his patrol car, but his own car. He tells them... He's working undercover. <laughs> Jeez. And they they buy it. Yeah. They they believe it. Well, why wouldn't you? I mean, it's a police officer, and you trust the police. You and... trust the guy in blue. He's a, yeah. he's a police officer. Yeah. yeah, He doesn't take them to the beach like he says he's going to. He drives them to a remote part of Hutchinson Island off State Road A1A. We know that highway. Yeah. Driven it a lot for spring break. Yeah. When they arrive in this swamp area on the island... He starts making sexual remarks, and then he draws a gun on them and tells them he plans to sell them as, quote, slaves what? to a foreign prostitution ring. Wow. He forces them out of the car. He handcuffs both girls. He leads them to a grove of trees where he ties nooses around their necks and forces them to balance their little tippy toes on top of tree roots. Yeah. If they slip... They'll hang themselves. Wow. Now, while they're in this precarious position, he molests and torments them both. He tells them he's going to leave for a bit. And while he's gone, they need to decide which one of them is going to die. Jeez. So Gerard promises, I'm going to return. But while he's gone, these girls escape. They reach the highway and they flag down a passing police car. Mm. Now, part of them has to be, yeah. oh, my gosh, it's another police officer. Is this good or is this bad? Yeah. Or is it him? Yeah, that's true. Now, by this time, Gerard goes back and discovers that these girls are missing. So what do you think he does? Freaks out. He calls the sheriff, his boss, Richard Crowder, and says, I've done something really stupid. You're going to be mad at me. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just, that's an understatement. He said he wanted to teach these two hitchhikers about the dangers of hitchhiking on the road. He took the girls into the woods, tied them up so they would feel some fear. The sheriff is losing his mind at this. Yeah, I would imagine. Gerard says when he went back to check on the girls, they disappeared. Now, Sheriff Crowder wants Gerard back at the office and they all head out to look for the girls only to find out that they had been picked up. And when they were asked what happened, the two girls said, we were picked up by Officer Schaefer and he lied to us and tied us up and molested us and told us one of us was going to die. Wow. So Schaefer is stripped of his badge. He's fired and he's charged with abduction, aggravated assault and false imprisonment. He's released on a $15,000 bail, and a trial date is set for four months later. Okay. Now, in November of 1972, he stands trial for his crimes against Nancy and Paula, and despite the severity of the crime, he strikes a deal to get a shorter sentence. Really? He pleads guilty to the assault charge, and the other counts are dropped. What? He is sentenced to... One year in the county jail wow. to be followed by three years probation. Okay. He asked the judge for a bail extension so he could relocate his new wife, Teresa Dean Schaefer, to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, uh, now, I had a hard time finding anything about when he married Teresa. 
but she's going to divorce him weeks after the trial. You think? And she's going to marry his defense attorney. (laughs) Well, there's some karma. Can't make that up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He is to show up in January to serve his sentence. He has two months of freedom before going to jail. Two months of freedom. All right. Before going to jail. That's a lot of time to wreak havoc. It's a lot of that's a lot of time if you're a serial killer. Yeah. Gerard Schaefer reports to the jail on January 15th, 1973, from the time he's charged in July to the time he actually has to show up in prison. He has been out six whole months. Jeez. Six months. Okay. Hold that thought. Holding. April 1st, 1973, St. Lucie County, Florida. Two men are collecting trash on Hutchinson Island. They're looking for cans to take in to recycle. What they find is a body without a head Mm. in the undergrowth of the swampy area. It's the decomposing remains of two young women, both beheaded. The bodies had been hacked up and buried in shallow graves, so shallow that the wildlife has dug them up and eaten on them. Mm. They can't tell how long they've been there or when they were murdered. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, it's Florida. So humidity, heat, the bodies start to decompose pretty quickly. Yeah. Their arms are bound with rags and their bones show signs of being cut with a hatchet. Hmm. And on a nearby tree, there are impressions of what could be rope burns on the bark like a noose around the neck. It shows it was an ugly murder. These girls were tied up hanged, and then slaughtered. Wow. The bodies are so badly decomposed, they have to use dental records to find out who these girls are. And they are 17-year-old Susan Place and 16-year-old Georgia Jessup. Hmm. Investigators question both of their parents. Susan's mother, Lucille, last saw her daughter six months prior when they were both picked up by a man named Jerry Shepard in Fort Lauderdale. Hmm. He had picked them both up to go play guitar at a nearby beach. And they never came back. Lucille had her doubts about Jerry, but he assured her, I'm going to take care of your daughter. And when they never returned home, the mothers of these two girls turned into sleuths. Hmm. Lucille and Shirley, George's mom, looked through the girls' things for clues. And Lucille had noted she had written down Gerard's license number along with the description of his car. Oh, wow. A blue-green Datsun. Now, Georgia has a letter that she's sent to Shepard that's been returned to Cinder. That address was the first thing these two moms used. They thought perhaps the girls had just run away. And the address is in the town of Stewart, Florida, about 80 miles away. That's the starting point. They go to Shepard's apartment, and when they meet the apartment manager, she says, there's no Jerry Shepard here. The man that lives here is Gerard Schaefer. (laughs) Now, the manager says, Gerard Schaefer's in jail for molesting two young girls on Hutchinson Island. Wow. And the moms are better than the cops. Yeah. And then they do go to the cops with their information, his car description and the plates, but he's already in prison. And the moms and the cops are like, these slayings are really similar, Mm -hmm. except Georgia and Susan didn't get away. But how do we link Gerard to the deaths of these other two girls? Right. So detectives need physical evidence. Okay. His wife, Teresa, says that Gerard gave her a suede purse as a gift. But when the bodies of the two girls are found, he calls from jail. (laughs) Okay. He calls his soon-to-be ex-wife, Teresa, Uh from jail and says... Get rid of it. Uh, Get rid of that purse. Throw it away. And she's going, well, why? Yeah. Yeah. And Georgia's mom says, quote, I gave her that bag for her birthday. End wow. quote. Mm. And Gerard had taken it as a memento of his crime. Jeez. And given it to his new wife. Wow. Who is now soon to be his ex-wife. Wow. Can you imagine what's going through her head when she finds all this out? I think she's in the arms of the defense attorney. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Wow. But Gerard seems to have the perfect alibi because when the bodies are discovered, he's already behind bars. He's been in jail since 1973. So he can't be in two places at one time. And since they can't determine when the girls were murdered, Hmm. there's, you know, 
there's doubt. Sure. Reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt. But there's a small window of opportunity for him to have done it. September 27th, 1972 is when he picked them up, two months after his release on bail, Hmm. during his six months of freedom. Right. So this is after he's already been picked up for tying the girls to the trees, and they let him go, that he kills these other two girls. Jeez. On April 7th of that same year, the police go to his mom's house. They go to Gerard Schaefer's mother's house. Okay. Because this is where he stored all of his stuff because his wife has left him for his defense attorney. Yeah. What they found was a stash of women's jewelry, 100-plus pages of writing and sketches depicting mutilation, murders of young women, yeah. newspaper clippings about two women missing since 1969. Really? And pieces of identification belonging to vanished hitchhikers, Collect Good Enough, and Barbara Wilcox, both 19 years old. Wow. The two girls were last seen alive on January 8th, a week before Gerard was sent to jail in Martin County. Their remains wouldn't be found until 1977. Wow. When no cause of death could be determined because they'd been out there for so long. Yeah, and they didn't have DNA back then either. They did not. It's the 70s. Yeah. On September 27, 1973, he stands trial for the murders of Georgia and Susan, and they find him guilty. The judge sentences him to two consecutive life terms in prison, but the homicide detectives think this isn't the end. Yeah. They don't think that Susan and Georgia were his only victims. Right. And acting on their hunch, they start to look at some of the missing person cases from across Florida to see if they can connect him in any way. Connecting the dots. He had skills. He had experience. Mm -hmm. He liked it. He was brazen. He had a taste for it. He did. Yeah. Now, there was a newspaper article about a girl named Lee Hainline. It was Gerard's next-door neighbor. She had been missing since 1969. The girl he used to peep in on. Uh, The girl he thought was leaving her blinds open on purpose. A piece of her jewelry was among the belongings that they found. Mm. It was a gold locket with her name, Lee, engraved inside. That's uh, pretty hard to dispute. Her body would be found in 1978. She left a note for her husband saying she was making a short trip to Miami. Her skull had multiple bullet holes Mm. and was discovered at a construction site in Palm Beach County. Wow. Now, there was more jewelry linked to the disappearance of another girl, 14-year-old Mary Broccolini, who vanished from Broward County with 13-year-old Elsie Farmer in October of 1972. Okay. Their remains were found in early 1973, but no cause of death could be determined and no charges were ever filed. But the stories, the graphic stories they found at Gerard's mother's house, they're tales of violence against women with illustrations to match. It was pornographic writings that were really gory and bad. It could be mere fantasies was what they discovered, but there's a theme a noose, yeah. tying victims up, right. mentally breaking them down into nothing. And they're wondering if what he's writing is fiction or if he's recounting what he's actually done. Right. Because he's a practiced killer, all trinkets and trophies kept behind. Right. He couldn't control himself. He was, he was a serial killer. Right. And they share the evidence with officers in other counties And the number of potential victims triples. Wow. Other states start calling in to see if he could be the killer of an unsolved case they have. 32 women were missing and all had some sort of tie to Gerard Schaefer. Really? It's all circumstantial and there are no bodies to go with them. Mm. In February of 1989, in Florida State Prison, Sandra London, an author who sends him a letter, is a woman who used to date him. Really? She wants to write a book about his crimes where she explores the inner workings of his mind. (laughs) And he agrees to collaborate. Of course he does. He's a narcissist. 
but her interest is more than professional. It's personal because she knew him back in high school when they were classmates. Right. She wants to publish his stories, those dark, horrible things that he wrote about killing people. Wow. Her book would be called, quote, Killer Fiction, end quote. Hmm. She publishes it, and then she published more volumes. Wow. She was actually his girlfriend. She says in an interview, quote, how could you know someone so well, so intimately for so long and not know they had a separate life? And you have no clue, end quote. But wasn't she the one, didn't they have like this really kind of dark relationship? Bondage? No, oh. no, that's a different girl. That's Cindy. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. I'm... That's Cindy, the one who got away. She came back and said we had to do all these weird okay. sex rape games. Okay, can't tell the players without a program. Right, so, yeah. right. This is the other girl that he dated after Cindy. Gotcha. Sandra. Okay. And Sandra said in 1964 he was the perfect catch. Tall, good-looking, blonde hair, blue eyes. But as their relationship developed, looking back, she could see glimpses of the man he would become. Yeah. He was really obsessed with the girl who lived next door, who would undress with the curtains open. He thought she was taunting him. Hmm. He's talking about Lee. And he would tell Sandra, she knows I'm watching. And he even said to her once, quote, I'm going to put a stop to that, end quote. Oh, gee. Now, Sandra didn't know it at the time, but he put women into these two categories. There were virgins, and then there were whores. Wow. And if you were a whore, you were fair game. And to him, Lee was a whore because she left her windows open. There was no gray area. No gray area. Wow. And when Sandra learns of Lee that she's dead, she's stunned. She realizes that he could have killed her at any point, he right. could have killed her, Sandra, sure. at any point when he was angry. Right. But he didn't. And just like the other missing women, they still can't link it to him. They can't link it to Gerard Schaefer. Mm -hmm. He's untouchable, and he knows it. And now, while he's in prison, he's under close watch. But he still managed to run a small mail fraud scheme <laughs> from his cell, having associates post ads in sex magazines. Jeez. He would send letters to people saying he was a 14-year-old girl. He would also send letters to other convicts in prison, love letters or sex letters. <laughs> wow. Where's Chris Hansen when you need him? <laughs> well, except he's not a 14-year-old girl. That's true. He's pretending to be a 14-year-old girl, yeah. and he's sending the love letters to guys in prison. <laughs> wow. The sex letters to guys in prison. Yeah. Yeah. But he's not well-liked among the other prisoners. Mm. But he did befriend one guy, fellow killer Ted Bundy. Oh, wow. These two liked to discuss counter-forensic techniques. Jeez. This is Ted Bundy's buddy. Good grief. In 1990, 20 years after Lee's slaying, Sandra can tell he still revels in the pain he's inflicted on his victims. She asks him if he still writes the stories like they found in his belongings at his mother's house. And he tells her, yeah, I do. These are graphic accounts of torture and murder. And you can actually buy this on Amazon. I will not be linking to it. Yeah. It will. You want to find it? Yeah. Go do it. Go, go on. You're on your own, people. Yeah, not going to contribute to that. Not contributing to that. Yeah. Yeah, he is quoted as saying, quote, Boy, do I still write those stories, end quote. Wow. Yeah, just like the ones they found in his mom's house, he's written more, and he's written it with this author, and he sees a, an opportunity to publish it and bask in the glory of what he's done to these women. He sends Sandra pages and pages of sickening stories and drawings. Mm. Quote, he tried to shock me and disgust me. The stories were vile, end quote. Okay, Gee. what did you expect? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What he can't do in person, he's now doing on paper. Man. His stories match the details of how Georgia Jessup, Susan Wells, and Lee Hainline are all murdered. It's almost like he's writing a confession. Yeah. Yeah. He writes the stories in first person. He's describing it as if he's there. 
It's an extension of reality for him. Mm. And when people read it, he was so tuned in to the torture, the mutilation, the sadistic nature of all of it. It's very real. (laughs) This isn't a lunatic writing this. This is a serial killer writing it. Wow. He's very careful not to incriminate himself in these writings. And when Sandra publishes everything, there's nothing to show that he killed more women. It's a, it's very logical to read it all. Right. But there's no there there. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. He's smart enough that he doesn't uh, incriminate himself. Exactly. Yeah. There's no physical evidence to place him at the crime scenes except for the book that he says is fiction. Right. And investigators can prove absolutely nothing. And remember, he's a cop, so he thinks like a cop. Sure. He says he's playing the cops for fools, Yeah. but the gloating is about to backfire. Uh Uh-oh. Because after Sandra publishes the stories, he starts writing her revealing letters where he says that his story, Murder Demons, described how he killed two 14-year-olds, Mary Briscolina and Elsie Farmer. Wow. Quote, What kind of crimes am I supposed to confess to? Farmer? Briscolina? What do you think Murder Demons is? You want confessions, but you don't recognize when I anoint you with them. And we've just gotten started, end quote. He just, he plays, he's superior to everyone. He's smarter than everybody else. I'm in the room. smarter than everybody else. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Mary and Elsie were last seen on October 23rd, 1972, and construction workers found their remains three months later near Fort Lauderdale. And from the beginning, they suspected a link to Gerard Schaefer because Mary's brooch was one of the items that they found at his mother's place. Right. And now he's admitting it. Right. He knows. He's suspected of 32 murders, but he says, quote, that's just the tip of the iceberg, Gee, end quote. Wow. He wanted to be the greatest serial killer of the century. <laughs> quote, I'm not claiming a huge number. I'd say it's somewhere between 80 and 110, but over eight years and three continents, end quote. Jeez. Three continents? Yeah, because he went to Africa. He, went, he went to, to Europe and America. Africa. Yeah. That's right. So Sandra realizes that he slipped up, and these letters are admissions of guilt. She's got to hand them over to the police. Sure. And she knows she's got the confessions of a murderer. Right, yeah. Now, these letters stun detectives. They reopen cases where they believe he's the killer. They plan to confront him with his own words, so he's going to crack and give the location of bodies so these families can have some closure. Right. So on December 1st, 1995, Schaefer is scheduled to be interviewed. Okay. But the day before, he is brutally attacked by his cellmate Hmm. for ratting out his fellow prisoners. Can't do that. His cellmate murders him. Wow. He stabbed him 18 times in each eye. Oh. And cuts him from his left ear across the mouth. To his right ear. Gave him a little joker. Snitches can't see and snitches can't Can't talk. talk. Wow. Snitches die. He was. Now, I also read he was murdered in his cell by his cellmate, Vincent Faustino Rivera, Mm -hmm. over a cup of hot water. (laughs) But I like the first story so much better. It's a bit more romantic. (laughs) (laughs) it's poetic justice is what it is there you go but now schaefer has carried to his grave where all these bodies Mm. are located cold cases that will never be closed that's too bad so he looked like a model officer of the law but he was a murderer he was a monster yep now in 2005 in fort lauderdale homicide detective john curio decided that he didn't want to let all these unknowns die with him sure He started gathering forensic evidence and sending it to the FBI's missing persons DNA database as a means to ID some of the other remains that they had found around South Florida. Sure. Because he thinks that Schaefer is responsible for the murders of a lot of women. Mm -hmm. And we just have to find the families of these victims and get their DNA entered and compared to all the unidentified remains sitting at the medical examiner's office. Sure. Like Carmen Halleck, who was 22, and Belinda Hitchens, who was also 22. 
They disappeared between 1968 and 1972, and they both had ties to Schaefer. Mm -hmm. When Gerard wrote one of his short stories called, quote, Carmen, Mm -hmm. in the story, she wore a black chiffon dress, and Karen Halleck bought a new black dress for a date with a teacher. (laughs) Gerard was a student teacher at Plantation High School the year she disappeared. So he'd been doing this forever. Police suspect that he abducted two young Pompano Beach friends, Peggy Ron, age nine, and Wendy Stevenson, age eight, in December of 1969. Witnesses told investigators the girls were last seen in the company of a man buying them ice cream from a convenience store at the beach. And a clerk gave a description of a man who police say fit Gerard Schaefer. These two little girls have never been found. Because of an April 19th, 1989 letter he wrote, which was later published, investigators feared that he murdered the young girls and ate their remains. Ugh. He wrote, quote, Peggy and Wendy just happened along at a time when I was curious about fish's cravings for the flesh of young girls, mm-hmm. meaning the killer fish, Albert sure. Fish. Right. I assure you these girls were not molested sexually. I found them both very satisfactory, particularly with sautéed onions and peppers, end quote. Oh, man. So police believe he committed scores of other murders, but he's never charged. Hmm. According to Richard McElwain, a former investigator with the Martin County State Attorney's Office who worked on the Oakland Park case, he said that Gerard could, quote, talk with the best of them. <laughs> he never admitted to killing anyone to me, but the stuff he put in his writings, the details of what we found at the crime scene are all in his stories, end quote. Just a match. His writings talked about finding a spot to bury the women and having them stand on an orange crate while he bound them. Quote, he'd strangle them, rape them, bury them, and then dig them up and rape them again, end quote. All the while, he maintains that his writings are fiction. Yeah, right. Now, I want to say that before he was killed in his prison cell, he tried to bring all kinds of lawsuits against people who publicly called him a serial killer. (laughs) true crime authors, FBI veteran Robert Ressler because he wrote about the case and discussed it during his lectures. Mm -hmm. He even sued a writer for describing him as fat. (laughs) Uh, Okay. But all that DNA that they put in way back when, amazingly enough, in June of 2022, another breakthrough was made. Oh, really? Really? Skeletal remains were found in a Florida mangrove swamp in 1974 and were identified as a missing teen, and the authorities think she may have been a victim of Gerard Mm Schaefer. Genetic genealogists from Texas-based Othram Incorporated have helped the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office identify the girl, previously known only as Singer Island Jane Doe. Mm. Her name is Susan Gale Poole. She was 15 when her family reported her missing from their Broward County trailer park just before Christmas in 1972. Wow. Nobody knew where she went. Her clothes and her purse were still at her friend's apartment that she was staying at. At the time, her family and friends didn't know if she had left of her own accord or if she had met with death or foul play because she had a history of hitchhiking Hmm. and had left home before. Okay. No sign of the missing teen was found until the morning of June 16, 1974, when a man and his sons went looking for driftwood in a swampy, wooded area of Singer Island known as Burnt Bridges. And according to news accounts at the time, they instead found scattered human remains and scraps of clothing. Mm. Quote, she was tied up in the mangroves with wire to a tree. She was skeletal remains, totally nothing left of her, except bones, end quote. Wow. Authorities attempted to use dental records to identify her at the time. She was estimated between 13 and 19 years old when she died, and she was believed to have been murdered between eight weeks and eight months before her remains were actually found. And there was no identification, and the case went cold for all those years. Mm. But this is around the same time that Gerard Schaefer is killing, because it's just five months prior that he is picked up for Ellen Trotter and Paula Sue Wells. Right. 
Because singer island Jane Doe, now known to be Susan Poole, was found bound to a mangrove tree, Palm Beach County authorities really believe that he was her killer. And DNA obtained from her mom, who is now in her 90s, proved that the Jane Doe in 1974 was actually her daughter. Wow. Yeah. And her mom and her siblings have found a little bit of measure of peace, knowing that they actually know what happened to her and they could lay her body to rest. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Quote, it's been a long time waiting to see what happened to their sister, end quote. Wow, that's so sad. There are so many things that we don't know about him, but what we do know for sure is that he liked to kill young females. Sometimes he liked to do two at a time, saying, quote, doing doubles is far more difficult than doing singles, but on the other hand, it also puts one in a position to have twice as much fun, end quote. Sick. This guy is horrible, worst of the worst. You don't really hear about him yeah. all that much because they can't say definitively right. that he is the killer for so many of these young girls. Right. But most people know or believe in their heart that he is. Right, yep. But that is the story of the serial killer cop, Gerard John Schaefer, and that's all I have to say about that. You know, it always makes me wonder, how does somebody snap like that? What causes them just to completely be that deviant and evil? I don't think he snapped. I think he started out mentally ill. He didn't think his dad liked him. He wanted to be a girl. He wanted to hurt himself. And that morphed into, instead of hurting himself, trying to be a girl, hurting women yeah. or girls. Yeah, it's just tragic. Yeah, very tragic. Yeah. Very tragic. But the fact that the fact that they had him and they let him out. Yeah. And he wreaked havoc in those months. Yeah. So he had six months to kill more people. Yeah. And he even admits that he had been doing it for years. Yeah. You know, I mean, he knew he had six months, so he just accelerated everything and got in as much as he possibly could. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. He's a bad guy, but let me tell you what, his, his cellmate... <laughs> Took care of that. Got him good. All right. Well, let's let's lighten it up just a little bit. Good Lord, we need to. With a little bless your heart. Well, bless your heart. All right, number one, I'm calling this one, it's in the details. Okay. All right. A drug dealer in Pennsylvania was arrested after he called the cops to his apartment saying that he was robbed. But when they, robbed. Yeah, yeah. But when they got there, they saw his drugs and paraphernalia sitting around in plain sight. Yeah. According to reports, 46-year-old Alan Phelan Jr. called the police to report that someone had broken a window and entered his apartment. Now, when officers arrived... It did not appear that anyone had broken into the residence. They asked Phelan if anything was missing. He took officers around his apartment where they found a pill bottle with a white powder was in clear view with a small measuring spoon. Oops. Hmm. What would that be? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's when they placed Phelan into custody and executed a search warrant. Okay. All right. During the search warrant, they found, here we go, 47 grams of fentanyl Ooh. and 71 packages of it valued at $25,000. Oh, my gosh. Yep. 13 grams of meth, mm. 20 grams of marijuana, Ooh. nine Suboxone strips, Ooh. and 12 Clonzepam, which I don't know what Clonzepam is, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> they just found a lot of drugs. So the guy was busted and he's put away. So there Damn, you go. son. Yeah. That's some serious drugs he's got there. Yeah, that's when you need to pay attention to the detail. Why did he call and say somebody had broken in? Yeah, who knows? He's sniffing his own fentanyl. Oh, thank you. Gee whiz. All right, number two. Number two. This is a short one. But you got to know your shortcomings. And I do. <laughs> I do. I'm reminded of them every day. No, you don't have any. According to reports, a 53-year-old man in Florida was caught stealing from a Walmart this week. Okay. Right? Why is it always a Walmart? All right. He mm. tried putting a bunch of stuff up his shirt and walk out the store, but Walmart security stopped him and called the cops. <laughs> Here we go. When the police caught up with him, he blurted out, quote, I'm not good at shoplifting. I'm not very good. 
in shoplifting. <laughs> he was hit with a felony because he had a couple of priors. Okay. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not very good at shoplifting. <laughs> Does that work? Uh, yeah, it's perfect. If, it, if only it was a steak. <laughs> yes. All right. And number three, and finally, what about that, you know, thou shalt not steal thing you didn't understand? It wasn't that the number two? <laughs> it should have been. <laughs> Okay, according to reports, a man broke into a Panama City church using a cinder block to break a window. The man, identified as Derek Porter, caused over $8,000 in damage to the facility. What's he looking for in a church? <laughs> Jesus? Here we go. <laughs> go Here on we go. Sunday. You'll Here find we... him. Here we go. A church employee heard the sound of the burglar smashing the window, and the employee hightailed out of there. Okay. Now, when police arrived and found him, he admitted to baptizing himself in the church's baptistry pool and claimed he wasn't sure everything he did inside the building. All right. Police reported Porter had several electronics, including a television and a computer from the church in his truck, along with the church's money bag. They also found drug and drug paraphernalia on him. <laughs> There's some uh, body cam footage during the arrest, and I guess he was, you know. He baptized himself. <laughs> He's been charged with burglary of an occupied structure, criminal mischief, possession of meth, and possession of drug paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. He got it all covered. Yeah, but his soul <laughs> has been saved, honey. He baptized himself. He was baptized while he was there. Yeah, he was trying to absolve himself of all sin that I he was about ready to do. I don't think I don't think stealing the church money bag is yeah. it kind of runs in the yeah. face of uh, jumping in the baptismal font. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. Well, if you have a bless your heart or you know somebody who needs to be washed in the water. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that's a new one right there. Oh my gosh. All you have to do is go to hitchtohomicide.com where there's a pull-down menu. While mm -hmm. you're there, you can also suggest a case. Yep. And you can tell us about your brush with true crime. Absolutely. That's all we have today. That's my amazing husband out there. And yeah, that's my beautiful bride right there in the booth. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. <laughs> Bye, y'all.